Hello everyone and welcome to the Scientix webinar using this crap on events and mysteries to enliven the teaching and learning of science. My name is Marina Jimenez and I will be moderating this session. With us today we have Patrick Dundon who is a post-primary teacher of biology, physics and mathematics and also a Scientix ambassador for Ireland. Um, last September of the last year, he conducted a, a first Scientix webinar entitled Quirky Ideas to Pike and Promote Student Interest in STEM Classroom, which was a big success. So Patrick will present this afternoon's topic over the next 45 minutes. And for the remaining 15 minutes, we will be welcoming your questions that you can already start thinking once he starts his presentation. So don't hesitate to use, the, to use the chat to ask any of your questions, but also to share any ideas related to the topic. Also here with us is my colleague Enrique with uh, the Scientix account. So you can address to him on the, uh, on the chat through the Scientix account. He will be helping you with any technical problems that you might have. So please address directly to him privately if you want to talk to him or if you're experiencing any difficulties. So I would also like to remind you to please turn off your cameras and microphones during the talk and address any questions in the chat. So that's all from my side and now I will leave Patrick to start the presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Marina. Yeah, Marina, hello. Thank you, uh, Marina, for the introduction. I hope everybody can hear uh, me satisfactorily and also I hope I'm up on video now. Um, if the broadband becomes an issue or the internet connection, I'd probably just uh, uh, kill the camera just to, to, to make things a little bit easier. Um, but hello, everybody. Anyway, my own name, uh, like uh, Marina said, is Patrick Dundon. I'm a Scientix Deputy Ambassador for Ireland. Um, and the title of my webinar is Using Discrepant Events and Mysteries to Enliven the, Enliven the Teaching and Learning of Science. Um, so we'll get underway. Patrick, sorry. sorry. Um, we cannot see your video, but we listen to you very well. But, okay, so uh, do, you, do you need to see the video, Marina? No, we, we don't, <laughs> but just so you would know. That's fine, that's better. Okay, that's great. I'll just okay. continue on as I am, I think. Okay. Yep. That's great, thank you. Um, uh, you might be better off not seeing me anyway, I think, to be honest about it, so it might suit everybody. Um, so that's the title of my uh, webinar, Using Discrepant Events and Mysteries to Enliven the Teaching and Learning of Science. Um, and like, not to dwell on this now, but like Maria said, uh, Marina, sorry, I'm a post-primary teacher. Uh, my students would be kind of between 12 and 18 years of age, and I teach in the southwest of Ireland in Limerick in a school called Castle Troy College, and my subjects are biology, physics, and uh, maths. Um, Deputy Ambassador, and I would have conducted my first webinar last September um, and found it a really enjoyable experience. So I hope uh, similarly today will go reasonably well and uh, would be very keen for people to uh, send in feedback via the chat, uh, even during the course of the webinar. And then at the end, we can have 15, 20 minutes uh, to kind of share ideas. And I hope to come away with something as well today. Um, in the mean, just I, 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 in the interim, since the last webinar, I would have been involved in bringing out a book in Ireland for a new junior certificate program in, uh, that starts in, in Irish schools in September 2016 uh, with, with a couple of colleagues of mine. And we would have incorporated some of the stuff that we talked about in the previous webinar in that. Um, anyway, like the last time, I just hope uh, everybody uh, kind of gets something from it that maybe you can use in your own classes in the next few days. And feel free to share your ideas. I'd be very keen to learn something myself today. Uh, over the course of this webinar, I looked at I kind of uh, going to look at five kind of ideas that I would use from time to time in my classes um, to kind of encourage students to engage with with STEM subjects um, to kind of encourage problem solving as well, uh, get them to kind of think outside the box and just rather than being force fed information to get them to think for themselves and to to to, to be kind of um, critical in the information that they receive to actually kind of question what they're being told. So broadly, we'll look at what I kind of think big questions, kind of higher order questions. I, I, I'd imagine some of us will be familiar with Fermi problems or Fermi questions. We look at the discrepant events and the use of mysteries in kind of uh, enlivening and just engaging students uh, for the teaching of STEM subjects. 
And I'll return to something that I introduced the last uh, webinar, which is the idea of these kind of uh, memes, science and mathematics memes. Uh, they get great response in my own school. I'll talk about that at the end. Um, anyway, all of these uh, uh, would have worked well for me in the past to kind of get students engaged. So rather than, again, just simply having them as consumers of information, forcing them to be a bit more kind of clued into what's going on and asking them questions as opposed to simply delivering them information. And we move on, so that's the introduction. So what are think big questions? What is my understanding of a think big question? And I'll go through numerous examples, not obviously with a view to asking the participants unless they want to have volunteer answers, but more uh, uh, with a view to giving uh, examples that I use uh, predominantly in biology and physics, really. So they're useful to help develop higher order thinking rather than just your traditional recall of facts and information, get them to kind of analyze critically evaluate information and uh, try to solve problems or to think and join the dots. Uh, it widens the net in terms of the students who are likely to answer questions. There is no strict right or wrong answer to these types of questions. So if you're ever going to get a student to kind of be brave and volunteer an answer, these are excellent questions to allow them that space and I suppose the safety to get it wrong because there is no real right or wrong answer. It helps to kind of join the dots across different topics and uh, subjects in some cases uh, across the three sciences, your physics, your chemistry, your biology. And it allows you to kind of tackle misconceptions that a lot of students would have in a kind of a fun, safe way. They can volunteer answers. They, it may indicate that there's some misconceptions. And then students, you can tease that out in a kind of a safe discussion or a dialogue. So I'm just going to show you examples that I would use when I'm introducing my own uh, fifth year biology students who would be kind of 15, maybe 16, 17 years of age. So, for, uh, and again, feel free now to maybe jot down examples here or even better volunteer what you believe to be suitable examples and we can discuss them at the end. So, why do your hands wrinkle when you put them in water? That would be a nice kind of a question. It's very different answers there. Why do dogs pant? Why do leaves turn a kind of an orangey, golden brown colour in autumn? What is the majority of household dust made up out of? And that's, uh, you can kind of, to an extent, uh, discuss them there when you tell them that the majority of household dust is actually dead skin. Uh, they always find that a little bit strange and a bit upsetting initially, but um, it's, a good, it's a good starter question as well. Uh, uh, there's an element of physics in this, I guess, why do kind of rabbits, or any animal for that matter, but particularly rabbits, when they happen to be in the middle of a dark road at night and the floodlights uh, come over the crest of a hill from a car, why do they stop dead in their tracks? Uh, in a kind of very uh, famous expression in Ireland anyway, like a rabbit caught in headlights. Why do lizards, uh, geckos, etc., why do they kind of lie uh, broadside to the sun when they want to warm up and why do they lie at a right angle to the sun when they want to cool down? Again, there's physics and kind of maths and that beyond the biology. Why are red blood cells the color, the shape that they are? And why are they so, so only so very slightly smaller than a capillary? In a surface area kind of commentary there. I like this one. Why do fish school or why do they travel in large numbers? And you're into the whole idea of then of um, safety and numbers, and again, that's another very common phrase that's used in Irish, or sorry, in in, in the English language, and it's a, it's a nice to be able to join the join the dots across your subjects as well. Uh, we have a big emphasis in Ireland on literacy, and I, you'll find that an awful lot of the expressions in everyday use actually come from a kind of a biology uh, or a science background, really. Why do birds fly in that formation when they're uh, in a lot of get migrating, possibly? Uh, there's physics there, obviously, as well, the whole idea of kind of um, uh, reducing air friction and so on, working together as a group. Um, why do different plants have different shaped leaves? When you look at grasses or pines, for instance, if you go further north, uh, it's about lodging of, of snow, etc., and making sure that they don't topple over. I like this one as well, even though the actual lamp, I just closed that window. Sorry. Why do um, why do why do parasites generally not kill their host? That like that image there looks like something out of a, a kind of a science fiction movie, but uh, it, it's some sort of a kind of a, a crayfish, I think, that is parasiticized uh, the mouth of a 
some sort of a, I don't know, an eel or a fish or something like that. But anyway, you get a lot of good discussion out of that. Um, the colour of your urine, why is it different colours? And then, so again, now I'll actually reference these. I have, I, I was debating whether I would have included them in the in the list of five topics earlier on, but these are really excellent. Um, and if you want to take something good from today's webinar, I think this could very well be it. These are known as concept cartoons, and they're 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 superb. They're produced by a guy in Scotland, I think, called Stuart Naylor. And for instance, it just gives you a scenario and potential answers to it. So I just read this one for people who might be struggling to see it there. Student A is holding up a balloon and my helium balloon doesn't float anymore. Student B uh, comments to the following effect. It will float if you warm it with a hairdryer. Student B says it will float if you cool it in the freezer. And student D says it will float if you let some of the helium out. So you can have a discussion around which one of those students, B, C or D, has happened upon the right explanation for why the actual um, why the helium balloon doesn't float. And again, it, it offers the opportunity for students to get it wrong because nobody is 100% sure of their ground there and it just in, uh, generates a good discussion. So concept cartoons, uh, and I think I'll show you that later on. Sorry, I'm going in the wrong direction. That's another one of these concept cartoons. Will it melt faster or slower if you put a coat on your, um, on your snowman? And again, I, I don't think there's any point in me reading these, but there are loads of them available, loads of them, and that's it actually. Um, that's the the URL if you want to look up that. Uh, they're 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 worth the investment actually. They're they're really really good, and they 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 straddle all of your sciences, but also your maths as well. Okay. Now, this one I kind of put up because uh, evolution is a difficult concept to uh, kind of. To teach, I suppose, to students, it's, it's quite abstract, and you've got the whole background of religion being taught in schools, etc., and that's an entirely different debate. But a big misconception, and I'd have to admit to having this misconception myself, is that evolutionary changes are driven by by need, and they aren't. You can't you can't dictate an evolutionary change. So this kind of image here. It produces a kind of a, gets you to think in those terms in a kind of a in a humorous way, uh, and you can have a discussion then around mutation, uh, um, those mutations that are successful being uh, kept on, and those that aren't successful being removed from the gene pool, etc. And um, again, I won't go through all of these here now, but good sources of these think big questions would be this website. Um, again, um, I presume Marina, uh, well, we, we definitely will this this PowerPoint. Our presentation will go up on the Scientix website in due course, so all of those URLs will be available on that anyway. Um, on to my second idea, which is the the Fermi problems or the Fermi problems or questions. Again, what what role do I see these playing in in my classroom uh, for both science and maths? Well, I suppose it's particularly useful for maths because it um, it allows students to practice. Uh, math skills such as estimation and also what I find there is kind of mental gymnastics just doing arithmetic either in their head or alternatively on a scrap of paper or on a kind of the, a match a kind of on a, a matchbox or something like that a uh, kind of an art that's being lost to an extent due to I suppose the proliferation of calculators and now especially most students would be carrying phones in their pocket and they have the access they have access to a calculator all all, all the time. Again, a little bit like the the big the think big questions, it definitely widens the net. It encourages students that wouldn't otherwise volunteer answers to have a go, because again, there's no particularly right or wrong answer here, and gives an, gives students help with the idea of the really really big or the really really small. And that can be a difficult idea in maths. I certainly won't uh, ask you to read that there, but that's a kind of a, a meme, I suppose, around Fermi problems. This is the classic Fermi problem. Uh, and again, I haven't used this in class now, but uh, when I was putting together a presentation, I think this is where it all stemmed from. How many piano tuners there are, are, are there in Chicago? And you can be taken through a, an approximate solution to that via this, uh, power, or via this link here. Get a rough idea of how many piano tuners that might be resident in Chicago. A couple of examples again, and I won't dwell on this unnecessarily, but what is the volume of air that I breathe in one day? So you have to get the students thinking in terms of the number of breaths per minute. You'd have to scale that up by the number per hour, 
per day and then you'd have to go and do your research to find out what's the typical volume of air that you take in in one inhalation and from that you can get an estimate of the volume of air that you inhale. So good quick uh, maths straddling both uh, your, your science, your biology but also your maths. And there's roughly a worked out solution there, I'll spare you that. Um, another one would be how many kernels of popcorn would it, fill, would it take to fill this classroom? So there obviously you're going to have to put a premium on measurement of the dimensions of your classroom. Uh, you get an idea of the volume from that, you're going to have to work out the volume of uh, a single kernel. Is that sufficient from the point of view of accuracy? Granted it's estimation, but would measuring one kernel be sufficient? You probably have to take, get it into a discussion around samples, the size of the sample, the fact that the kernel is in a regular shape, and then you have to work out how many uh, kernels pop and what, what volume do they take up before you can get an estimation of that. So again, useful and you can have a bit of fun around that. And that's the fourth dog solution. This is a nice one, probably kids know because they're so, uh, they spend so much of their lifetimes in front of phones or on the phone, uh, they might be interested in this. So how many people are actually taking or talking on, on mobile phones at any given minute? In the destination here. And again, there, there's loads of these available. Um, again, uh, a lot of them, of course, are kind of maxi, but um, you can you can find Fermi problems with a science twist as well, physics, chemistry, and biology. At this point, it's probably worth just pausing for a minute and just asking, is the pace that I'm talking at okay? And is the connection still reasonably strong? I'm not hearing anything to connection is Yeah, everything is fine. Connection, video, and we hear you okay. It's okay. A pace of talking, Marina? That's a little bit, <laughs> a little bit fast, maybe. Okay, I'll try and slow that down a small little bit. It's always a worry. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Now, the discrepant events, this is um, something that I'm relatively new to um, and my background here is I would have got involved um, with uh, the Professional Development Service for Teachers in Ireland and I would have encountered discrepant events uh, from one of my colleagues and then more recently I would have got involved in a European project called uh, TEMI, T-E-M-I, Teaching in uh, Teaching Through Mysteries Incorporated. So what a very brief definition of a discrepant event. It's something that you present to students that doesn't turn out as expected. So for example, why does this balloon not burst even though you push a skewer through it? You intuitively we would expect that it would burst, but it doesn't. And you have to then you present that as a problem, I suppose, that students have to uh, provide a, a reasonable answer to, or at least an answer that uh, they can justify whether it's right or wrong, you can tease that out thereafter. Definitely something like that, if you come into class with a with a balloon with a skewer to it, it is going to pique their interest and their natural sense of wonder and curiosity. Again, a little bit like the um, think big questions earlier, it does help to kind of tackle what type of misconceptions the students might have. Uh, when they come into your science classes. And uh, again, this is a recurring team. Every student is going to chance their arm with an answer there. There is no, nobody comes in having that answer prepared in advance. So you need to, students can have a go. If they get it wrong, it's a safe environment. They shouldn't really be worried about getting it wrong. So what did it, in, in terms of uh, uh, discrepant events, what at what should happen inside in the class to make them useful. Well, students should have time to observe and investigate the event. They should ideally probably pair up or work in small groups so that they can think and discuss what they have seen, bring to bear all of their previous knowledge and experience to try and explain what they have seen. Um, broaden that discussion then out to the class. Teacher can chair that discussion. Um, identify what uh, suggestions might have strengths, also identify suggestions that have, might, might have weaknesses and also try to maybe sort out any of the misconceptions that might be evident at that point and then give them an, ex uh, give them an opportunity to actually frame an, uh, an explanation at the end, uh, an, an all-encompassing explanation at the end. 
Um, oops, sorry, I'll just go back there for a moment. Yeah, I, I, I won't dwell on too many of these, but a nice example of that there, uh, and there's loads of stuff online on this, and I'll show you references to it in a moment, is get a normal glass funnel, uh, get a straw, attach the straw to the end of the funnel, and put in a light polystyrene ball. Blow into the, the straw, and you would naturally expect that the polystyrene ball would actually be blown away from you, whereas in reality what happens is that it lifts up and again you present that as, a, as, a, as an event that I wouldn't have expected myself when I was a student in school and you try to tease out why that might be happening and you'll possibly get uh, to the idea of does this have parallels with uh, the, why, why planes are able to actually, you know, why planes are able to stay in the air in the sense that the air travels faster over the top of a wing than it does under the bottom. Does that give some sort of lift? And it can be, you're dealing possibly with 13, 14 year old students here, so the language may not be there, like lift and thrust, etc. But it, does it need to be there? Um, if they can get their, if they can get their head some way around it, then it's probably sufficient. Just after getting a chat message there, Marina, that there might be an issue around the volume. We hear you properly. Is anybody else having a problem? Please share it in the chat. Uh, otherwise, I think it might be something specific. No, okay. Okay, okay we'll, we'll start it through the chat. Uh, Enrique yeah. will do it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so again, I suppose if you want to put the real physics on it, if you went to, no problem, <laughs> Suthira. If you wanted to go a little bit more, you, you're into the idea of Bernoulli event, uh, Bernoulli's principle and so on there. And um, I just say, you know, for any of the discrepant events that I suggest here, this will be the first and last time that I give an explanation because I don't want the patronized teachers uh, I'm sure you can tell me lots of things. Uh, I'm by no means an expert on this, but these are just some suggested examples. Other examples of discrepant events would, I actually, I've done this one, but with eggs. Um, and basically it's just uh, bottles that you have heated, uh, you've removed the air from, sorry, you, just, you start off with a, a glass bottle or, uh, or a conical glass. You put a small amount of water into the bottom of it and you evaporate that water and then you put a balloon into the neck of the conical flask. And what happens is you're, the, the, the air obviously has, uh, the, the water has evaporated. The air has been removed, or at least a lot of the air has been removed. So you create a vacuum. And over time, it sucks the actual balloon, in this case, into the bottle. Again, completely counterintuitive because the balloon is bigger than the neck of the bottle. So you wonder why or how that has happened. And it's a, students really like that when it's done regularly as a demonstration of atmospheric pressure in Irish uh, schools with um, what we call junior sighted students, which would be around 13, 14, 15 years of age. This is actually a little bit of a trick. You're trying to blow up, blow up sorry, a balloon inside in a plastic bottle and it doesn't blow up and you get students to try and explain. I might leave that one hang in the air as a mystery because it's a little bit of a cheat. Uh, there might be a small hole involved somewhere in the large plastic bottle that the students don't know anything about. But anyway, there's a bit of magic in Rosner too. Uh, this is a, a resident, if, you, if anybody was looking at the previous webinar, they would have seen this guy as well, the balancing board. I just have a few of these dotted around the lab uh, and this guy gets a good reaction because he shouldn't really be balancing by all by any stretch of the imagination, but he does and it enters into a discussion then around centre of gravity and so on. This is a nice one. Haven't tried this in the lab. I have to admit, I just robbed this image from Google. Uh, why, if you were to walk on a single leg, it would most certainly crack under your weight, but not so if you were to walk on rows of eggs. You could do something similar with nails as well, but it's probably not a good idea in schools, I would think. This one then is putting ice onto surfaces of different temperatures and seeing what happens. And there's an explanation of that guy there. I won't get into it now, but it, it's a nice one that uh, does kind of get students to think. Again, th this, these things here at the front, they are used. Um, they're used actually by gardeners or horticulturalists, I think, to make sure uh, to retain water. But what happens is when you put them into water, they, they swell. 
but they have the same refractive index as water. So students won't actually see these balls inside in the water. You put your hand into the beaker, and to all intents and purposes, the student thinks you're putting your hand into a beaker of water, and then you come out with a whole heap of these little silvery balls here, and uh, there's a bit of a kind of a wow factor there. Um, and it's a nice link to the chemistry. Now, chemistry isn't my background, um, but I I do use this, and again, I would have that on display in the in the lab. This one, taking a screwdriver, putting it into a bottle of rice, and you would imagine that if you went to pull the screwdriver out, it would come out with no problem, and you'd lose your bottle of rice under the force of gravity, but not so. And why not? For debate, for discussion. Yeah, this one now, again, is an image that I have uh, uh, robbed off, uh, off Google Images. Uh, Newton's third law. Now, students don't need to know that, but I think intuitively, if you had that type of a setup, where a student or was on a trolley, for instance, and if they threw a ball to their left, you would expect them to follow the ball. But of course they don't, and that's Newton's third law. Every action has an equal and opposite reaction. But again, it's a nice little introduction to the whole idea of uh, mechanics and Newton's, third, uh, and Newton's laws in general. This isn't a particularly good image, but it's a ni another nice little toy. Um, it's known as the Cartesian diver. And there's a little fella up here uh, a kind of a plastic little bubble of uh, of, a, of, of a liquid that's of a lower density. So as it stands at the moment, it's floating in water. However, when you apply a pressure or if you squeeze the size of the bottle, our little man in here starts to de to descend. And why you're into a night, you're into a discussion around the role of pressure, volume, buoyancy, density. Uh, a really good starter. Um, and these are available actually in toy shops. Um, it wouldn't be that unusual to see them in toy shops in Ireland. A balloon held above a candle. We fully expect that that will burst, and will do if the balloon is simply filled with air. However, if you put a small amount of water into the bottom of the balloon. And if the balloon is dark enough, students possibly can't see that, uh, it doesn't burst. And that really kind of throws them for a minute. It wrecks their head. You're wondering, why didn't that burst? And then it's up to you to, choose, it's up to, you to decide whether you, uh, whether you put them out of their misery and tell them why, what, what, made, uh, what guaranteed that the balloon wouldn't burst. And of course, it's the water. And it's into a discussion of specific heat capacity if, you, if you're of a mind to do so. This is another nice one for for density, which is uh, kind of, well in Ireland anyway. We introduce density to to, to young young students, um, kind of 13, 14 years of age. And it's a difficult concept. Uh, it's a bit abstract. This is a nice one here. Uh, two cans. I have no particular uh, loyalty to Pepsi. Now I'm sure you could use Coke if you wanted, or any other for that matter. But there's a difference in the actual uh, densities of the two products. And what we'll call the full sugar Pepsi sinks, and the diet Pepsi doesn't. And again, why you're into a discussion about density, but also the composition of the of the soft drink that you're consuming. This is another nice one here, uh, having two arrows going in um, in the same direction. Actually, uh, yeah, sorry, going in opposite directions, and you bring a glass of water in front of them, and they reverse direction, refraction is is what you're after there. And there's actually, as an aside now, there's a, a an advertisement for cars in Ireland. I can't remember what the brand is, but they actually use that in it, the idea of the arrows reversing direction when you look at them through uh, a kind of a container of water. This is another nice one. I won't do this justice here, but if you were to take two books, for example, um, phone books, and if you were to put one page, a page from one phone book, on top of a page of another phone book, and then complete, re repeat that process until, until such time as the two phone books, all of the leaves or pages are intertwined and try to pull them apart, it's practically impossible. And that is a, a very, very, very unusual concept, a very unusual idea. And students struggle with that one. It was actually the subject of, a, of an episode of Mythbusters, uh, and they had to, I think, use two tanks to pull them apart for a finish. Uh, and the, the YouTube video is linked there. The last couple of these discrepant events, 
um, you can kind of ignore that really. But if you're shining three lights here, so uh, uh, through a blue filter, a red filter, and a green filter, we're into the idea of you know uh, the summative effects uh, of adding colors, or adding colors, the summative effect. And when you add the three of them in the correct proportions and intensities, you will get white light. But what happens if you put a green filter over a blue filter over a red filter, and you pose that question? It, then you're into not the summative or the additive effects, but you're into the kind of um, the subtractive effects or removing colors, and it goes black. And again, that's a, that's a concept that students, they would have fully expected if this gave me white light, well then similarly this should have given me white light. And then you're, you're into a discussion about well, are you adding colors together or are you actually prohibiting or stopping uh, white light, uh, sorry, are you stopping uh, light traveling through? And in this case here, uh, where it's nominally black, all of the light has been has been absorbed. It's no longer being transmitted, hence it's white. This is another one as well. Now, the images aren't great here, but you're all familiar with the you know the image of a tree on the ground when the in, when it, the image of its shadow, sorry, the, the shadow forming on the ground. But if you get the right location, you would expect that the gaps in the trees between the leaves would be the spots of light that you would find on the ground. But if, those, if the gaps between the leaves are sufficiently small, all of the patches of light will be circular. And why? Because you have to assume that not all of the gaps between the leaves are circular, so why would these be circular? And you're into the idea of the pinhole camera there and you're actually getting an image of the sun there, which of course is circular, as opposed to an image of the shape of the space between the leaves. Really, really nice one. Um, and I've done this in class with using the, the strip lights in the ceiling of the lab and gets really good results. This guy, Derek Muller, has a website uh, called Veritasium, and there's some really excellent stuff there about uh, where he goes chatting to members of the public uh, and teasing out what they believed to be, I suppose, the scientific explanations for fairly common everyday events or phenomena and just teasing out some of the misconceptions that they have. So there's a good source of discrepant events there. And again, other examples would be uh, accessible via these URLs here, but any basic Google search of discrepant events will throw up a huge number of resources there. Second last one then. I hope I'm all right for time, Marina, am I? Yes, you're fine. Great for time, yeah. These will be pretty quick anyway. Um, mysteries then is, I suppose, linked to these discrepant events, and uh, I'm predominantly going to talk about um, about my engagement with Timmy. So what is a mystery? It's a phenomenon or an event that induces the perception of suspense and wonder in the learning, which promotes curiosity and initiates the posing of questions to be answered by inquiry and problem-solving activities. So I suppose the, the little image on the right-hand side here is why do you... Uh, why do you blush? Why do you uh, why do you yawn, etc. Okay, uh, and, and getting students to think about those things. Uh, again, what's the rationale for it? Well, I suppose a little bit like all of the four, all of the three that have come previously. I think it kind of gets to the uh, gets to the into the students' natural curiosity and their kind of sense of wonder. We're all born with that. It's probably formal education removes it to an extent. Again, the misconceptions encourages other students to have a go. And again, you'll find that some students really, really get this uh, and they go off and do their own independent work without any steering from the teacher. There's a really nice one. It's not particularly timely for this time of the year, but uh, the question is, is Santa real? And you're into basically pulling that story apart from the point of view of the physics, seeing could one man steering however many reindeer get around uh, the globe in 24 hours, uh, and I think the the physics blows that out of the water. But it's nice, it's a nice one maybe to do at the appropriate time of the year, maybe in late December when kids are on the winding down. Anyway, my involvement is was recently with Timmy, um, and that's the URL for their website. So teaching mysteries with uh, teaching inquiries, sorry, with mysteries and Okay, they run a five E model as it's described. And the first one is to engage the students, so a kind of a hook. Then you have to explore that mystery. Again, that could be through independent research. It could be through pair work. It could be running simple little experiments 
or investigations. On the basis of their research and what they found out, they have to try and provide an explanation for that mystery. Then they have to develop their communication skills, so they have to elaborate, they have to do maybe further research, they have to present to their peers, and then at the end they have to come together and evaluate their, I suppose, suggested, suggested a solution to the mystery, and they have to be able to justify it. And it works reasonably well. And it's not overly prescriptive. It doesn't have you, well, I found that I didn't stick to it religiously, and it worked, it worked fine. Um, there's lots of mysteries. I only have, again, I'm conscious of time here now. I've, I've selected a couple of examples from this book, but that's a PDF with um, upwards of 20 or 30 mysteries. They all feature kind of suggested methodologies, the lesson plans, the equipment you might need, starter questions, all of that sort of stuff. And again, I've just selected a couple of them here now, and I'll run through it quite quickly. Um, so this one is why did, uh, why did mammoths become extinct? Again, there are, some of these actually have um, have YouTube videos, or sorry, they're um, kind of uh, PowerPoints or slides that uh, accompany the, the mystery that you can use in class if you wish. Um, yeah, if you put steel, wool, and plasticine on the knife edge there, and the, this is obviously law of lever or kind of uh, moments, etc., and they're perfectly balanced as it stands. But if you ignite the steel wool, so if you burn it, what's going to happen? And you pose that as a question. Most students will tell you that the little um, that your um, seesaw will now fall down here as per the plasticine, but actually the reverse of the true uh, is correct. It gets heavier and, uh, and this falls and why you're into kind of a discussion around combustion and what happens during combustion. That's called a chemical seesaw. I'd say most people might be familiar with this at this stage. Um, looking at breakfast cereals, particularly those breakfast cereals that have been fortified with iron, and can you uh, can you actually identify the iron in it? And it's easily done with a magnet. Uh, and again, it's a nice one for students because it's all <laughs> we all experience, we all look and hear or see that there's iron in the ingredients list, but um, actually to physically see it is, 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 is quite something. And students really impressed that. So that their mystery in the Timmy booklet is, are you eating nails? Uh, I like this one as well, um, and it's probably more pre more relevant for some of our uh, colleagues in countries that get a little bit colder. But why do we put I, why do we put salt on footpaths and roads? And the common misconception there is that it is um, causes the um, I suppose the ice to melt faster, but it's just that it melts at a lower temperature, I think. And again, of course, you're into why do they have grit mixed in with it and a discussion of friction, etc. So changes of state and friction. So grit on the streets. Uh, this one has, oops, sorry. This one has been done to date. Uh, the 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 Mintos and Coke, but they have a slight variation on the team here. And in my previous webinar, I would have talked about this as well. But uh, and I modified it as a kind of a, an investigation, looking at surface area of the Mintos, the number of Mintos, the effect of different types of drink, whether it was salt, whether it was diet Pepsi or normal Pepsi, etc. So uh, that's a, a fairly straightforward one. Uh, this Kai wheel, again, I'm not from, I'm not overly familiar with this. I have seen a colleague of mine run it, but um, it's uh, why does it kind of always, why does it always come up as you would have expected? It's a bit of a maxi one. And then the random number generator as well. So there's a mystery around that. I have to I'll be honest, I haven't done that one though. I haven't done the random mystery or the, the random generator. This one might be a little bit dodgy, but another one that I have in the lab is this uh, Jesus Shaves mug. Uh, and when you put hot water into it, he loses his beard. And why? Uh, into the idea of thermochromic materials, and they love that. Uh, it's probably, you need to know your audience, I think, before you use that one. This is another guy. He's constantly on display in the lab. Uh, the insatiable birdie. He's constantly bobbing up and down, even though he's very obviously not hooked up to any power supply, etc. But it's the whole idea of a kind of a thermodynamic in engine, um, and the whole idea of evaporation and the liquid that's in here, centers of gravity. It's really, really nice. Uh, the kids love that one. And then finally, you'll be glad to know uh, 
we'll run, we'll, we'll make for home in the presentation with a, a word on the STEM memes. Um, now, I, I started using these maybe two or three years ago, and it's quite depressing, really, that that is the best thing I think I've ever done in school, uh, is these things, putting pictures up on doors, but it gets an unbelievable reaction from students. So that will be the door of my lab, and I change these guys maybe once every, I try to change them every week. Uh, what, what's their role? It gets students to the door. You actually have students come to the door of the lab that have that I don't teach, uh, just to see what's up on the door this uh, this uh, this week, and that can't be bad because it encourages them to get involved. It's pretty easily done as well. All you're doing is printing off a couple of coloured A4 pages. Promotes learning by accident. They mightn't realise it, but they're probably learning something when they're looking at them. Generates a good atmosphere in class. They come in kind of talking about it or suggesting other ones that should could be put up on the door. In some cases, they actually bring them in and hope that you put them up on the door. And more recently, I've started kind of putting up maxi problems on the door, um, and students don't realize it, but they, uh, it's, a, it's a really nice introduction to algebra. And I'll show you some examples of these here now, and we're nearly there. The heavy talking has been done anyway. So that was the one that was up last week. The first one is kind of funny. I don't know if the quality of the image is sufficient, but it says the world's most accurate pie chart, and it's got sky, the, f the front of a pyramid, and the shaded side of a pyramid. I thought that was quite clever. And then this one here, uh, this got great reaction actually, and if anybody wants to tell me uh, the best answer I could possibly give to it, I'm all ears. Um, if it's zero degrees outside today, and it's supposed to be twice as cold tomorrow, how cold is it going to be tomorrow? Um, Got lots of wrong answers, and I don't know if I've given the right answer yet. But anyway, and then some of them are just, you know, very gimmicky. So periodic table, obviously, scientific method. And again, I'd be a big believer in this. We, in the, we kind of all all students when they were born, of course, were all kind of curious. They were putting everything they wanted into their mouth. But uh, by the time they rock around to maybe 13, 14 years of age, a lot of the time we've that driven out of them. Um, and it's a pity, really, so just bring it back to the really nuts and bolts of the scientific method. No, sorry. And then some of them are just, I'll let you read that one for a second. So you can have a little bit of fun with these things. Um, and they brighten up the wall as well. Once they come down off the door of the lab, they go up on the wall and, lab, and students can, can revisit them and just have a look at them. The world's most accurate pie chart. So, sorry if I'm coming across extremely childish here now as well. But that won't be a surprise to people that know me, I think. For the, for the female students, I think. Not a big fan of that one, but I said I better put it in for a bit of a balance for chemistry. And that similarly. Yeah, and these maxi ones now have got a great reaction. I have to say, um, these are I've only started putting these up, and some of them aren't. Some of them are just kind of again quirky or gimmicky. But you'd be amazed the amount of time that they'll start trying to spend trying to puzzle these things out. And again, these are all the available. But look, they're all available online. Anyway, all you need to do is Google uh, kind of uh, maths memes, and you'll find loads of these. Um, that's a nice one as well. I have to be honest, I got that wrong, and I have been told several times I got it wrong by the students. They really enjoy that. And this is into the algebra stuff. Then, um, uh, kind of what I said earlier on, the learning by accident. You're taking it away from the X's, the Y's, the Z's, and you're Pleasure. sorry, and you are making it a lot more accessible. And they actually get it right. And and they're if you put if you provided that as X's and Y's and Z's, a lot of them would have been turned off ever before they'd even tried uh, or had a go at it. And they they're stunned that they get it right. So it's a bit of a childish one as well for the mathematicians amongst us. Another one of these guys. Yeah, <laughs> moving one match. I think I've got the answer to that, but 
there's a number of possible solutions. I'll try one and I'll probably get it wrong. I think this match can be relocated to here and it gives you eight less four, giving you four. But there are other solutions by all accounts. Um, I don't have the time now, to be honest, to go through them. But um, they generate a good bit of debate. Yeah. You'd want to be a match teacher there for this, I think. Yeah, this one caught me. Um, and just in case anybody goes looking for this now and you want to get it right, if it's to spare you the embarrassment in front of your, of your students like myself, be careful here. There's four bananas, four bananas, four bananas, three bananas. That's what caught me. And this is a one full coconut. This is a half a coconut. And I did not realize that initially. And I am still paying for that, I have to be honest. But anyway, like that one as well. Yeah, back into the X's and Y's and introducing them kind of slowly, I think. For the physics people. A bit more, I suppose, serious. Which one of those is which one of those paths A, B, C will get you sorry, which one of those um which one of those potential paths one, two or three will get you from A to B quickest? Will there be any difference at all? One for uh, the farmers amongst us. We also have agricultural science in Ireland as a subject, so I quite like that one. Not too many of our students, I think, now get that, to be honest. This is very clever for the biology teachers. Really like that one, although the image is in great quality. And our kitty with his opposable tongue. Evolution happening in front of you. Be, be afraid. Be very afraid. No, then they can some, sometimes you can actually throw up stuff that's a bit more serious and maybe a little bit more traditional. And the blood type one is a really nice one there. Because most students will have heard of blood types, but they won't be aware what their blood type is. There's a very simple table there that tells you who can be who you can donate to and who you can receive from. And yeah, a bit of a childish one as well. Uh, I suppose a nod in the direction of Leonardo DiCaprio after getting his Oscar. And then you can actually maybe kind of broach some maybe more serious topics and some of the nonsense that's often discussed around science, the whole idea of nonsense diets, detox, all that sort of rubbish. And you can um you can have a I suppose you can have a conversation about how you blow that out of the water just by talking about simple biology or excretory system. Uh, there's only one thing that's going to filter your, uh, that's going to cleanse your blood of waste, and that's the kidney. Not any sort of stupid fed kind of diets or detox or any of that sort of nonsense. I hope you found this humorous anyway. If not, a small little bit sad, I'd imagine, but we'll get over that. And I'll leave you with a final thought. I think that's nice where you'd like to take your teaching. I am miles away from that at the moment because we have a fascination with exams. I presume we're no different in other countries. Like in Ireland, it's overbearing, but you try and make uh, windows where you move away from the exam. And that's kind of wrapping it up, really. So thanks for taking part. And I'm contactable there. Feel free to contact me on that email address if you want. I have a Twitter handle. I don't use it all that often. It's actually the name of my lab. Shomer 42 is my lab and school. Um, and anyway, uh, I think that's more or less it, is it? Oh, yeah, just the link to the previous webinar as well. I think, uh, yeah, it is on the Scientix portal. I think it's available on YouTube as well, I think. Um, that is it, I think. Marina, I'll hand back to you. Thank you, Patrick. It was really good. We were having some laughs here at UN about the memes. Okay, very good. Um, there are some comments in the chat. Um, let me see. Um, you people have really liked it, and they shared also the link for the teaching mysteries. Um, Irina here likes learning by accident. Okay. Um, there is one question by Gudmundur. He's asking if you have uh, idea. Do you have idea bank for STEM memes? Um, I do. Yes. Well, just ones that I've kind of collected, and I put them onto a, a PowerPoint, uh, Marina. Um, mm -hmm. 
Now, it, it, it's one that uh, I think I may have about 250 or thereabouts on it. Um, now, there's obviously issues around copyright. I just pull these down off, um, off, off Google, to be honest, and, and there's some very good um, kind of pages on Facebook uh, that, that put up a lot of these science memes, and I just save them onto the phone as I, as, I, as I encounter them, and then select a number of them and print them off, really, and put them up on the door. So they're, they're easily accessible, but if anybody wants that PowerPoint file, if, I can, if we can find some sort of vehicle to send it out, I have absolutely no problem, but bear in mind, there's copyright issues, I think. Yeah, and uh, just so everybody knows, we will share this presentation with everyone. It will be on the Scientix website as well, so everyone can uh, use all of the links there. But yes, of course, we should be aware of the copyright. Um, I'm not sure if anybody else has any question. If they do, please put it in the chat right now. Uh, I'll wait a couple of minutes to see if there's any other comment. Um, Tatiana just shared uh, um, a link. Uh, she said, here's an idea about Cartesius from one of my students some years ago. So um, please check that link if you're interested. Um, I'll wait another minute to see if anyone asks something. Yeah, that's perfect. Thanks, Marina. There is uh, one comment. Uh, Sophia is asking, do you have advice for me teachers? I'm not sure what kind of specific advice. advice. Uh, uh, do, uh, new teachers. Um, oh. Yeah. I, I think just kind of use your, pre, your colleagues' experience. They're all you know, they, you're going to make mistakes when you're, when you're teaching. That is absolutely inevitable. And how uh, how good or bad you are is kind of dependent on how 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 much you want to learn from those mistakes, and you should seek advice of of uh, of your colleagues that you're working with. Um, because my experience is that they're only too too keen to help, um, and just trust your instincts. Really, they're, you if you, if something goes if something doesn't work, it's better to know that it doesn't work and then modify it and go again rather than to never have tried it in the first place. So that those kind of STEM memes there, they're a classic example of that. It was just by pure accident that I put those up on the door. There was no real thinking in it, and it got an unbelievably good response. So um, just have a go. You're always going to be getting better. You'll be the, the best teacher you'll be, I presume, is the day you retire. So you'll be learning up to that point. Certainly am anyway. Okay. Um, there's another question from Gudmundur as well. He's asking, what is best? What is the best way to address open questions and introducing mysteries for students? Yeah, there there'd be different kinds of trains of thought on that. It depends how 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 scaffolded you want to make it. It's a it's a big discussion in Ireland at the minute. Do you go into open-ended inquiry or do you scaffold it? How much training do the do students require in that before you can? Before you can leave them to their to their own devices, and um, the example that I use is I, I start off with a, I don't have it here now, but it's a, where you just have one piece of equipment and it's basically a meter stick, and this is how I train them. And the idea, the question that you pose is, will there be the number of times that you're spun around? Will that influence your reaction times? And you get the students to work in pairs. And one student will hold the meter stick in front of the other. The other, the, the second student will have their hands just apart, the palms facing each other. And that student will have their palms in front, and they will say one, two, three, go. And the other student will release the meter stick, and they have to clap their hands and catch the meter stick. And that's your control, and you record how far the meter stick has fallen. Take a break for a couple of seconds, then spin the student around and repeat it again and see how far the meter stick falls this time. And you'd expect that it will fall a little bit further. And you repeat for an increased number of spins. And you're into investigating a problem. Will your reaction times be affected by the number of times that you're spun around? They're designing their own experiment. They're identifying things that they're changing, their variables, etc. And it's very simple. It can be done in a classroom if you don't have access to a lab. But it's getting across some really, really key ideas. And um, maybe 
in terms of the open-ended questions, it, it was a Goodmanson, was it? I think Marina might be pronouncing the name incorrectly, but my yes, yes, it's correct. My, my experience with that is just they'll get very familiar with the way that you teach, and they are expecting you to be asking kind of crazy questions sometimes, and it's fine. Uh, your your biggest job there is to make sure that you don't completely and utterly lose the run of the class and you you don't forget to do what you have to do because sometimes these questions can take you off on in, on, on, in completely different directions to which you had expected. But my experience is you still get the stuff covered, but it's just um, it's it's just in a more uh, kind of an informal way that promotes discussion. That's my own take on it anyway. Okay, thank you for the answer. There's another comment from Sakita. She says that she saw similar activity on reaction times with multitasking that led to a talk about not texting while driving. Oh, very good, okay. Um, there's another question from Nicole. Uh, she's asking, you show examples only for little students. Have you got examples for uh, older students, so 18, 19 years old? Is that... Um... Is that kind of in inquiry examples, Marina or Nicole? I am um, like my my the oldest students that I would teach now would be would be seventeen year olds, eighteen year old maximum. Um, but I would still find that that example with the meter stick it works fine with older students. The 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 issue is if I'm teaching them that as eighteen year olds, they're about to go out the door of our school at eighteen. It's too late. Um, but I, the Irish system is changing. We have a, a new junior science program starting in September. So one of the big reasons for that is to kind of promote inquiry, the act of science, rather than just the body of knowledge or content. So maybe in a year or two's time, I can come back and update on that. But um, sorry, no, Nicole, I don't have any specific examples off the top of my head for 18 or 19 year olds. But I can't imagine they'd be hugely different to what you'd be doing with younger students. Maybe you could just... Uh, find examples online or possibly even that Timmy booklet would have other examples that might be more appropriate for older students. Okay, so um, so far uh, we don't seem to have any other questions. So just some comments, um, some motivational comments. We all learned from our mistakes. We always open to something new and many thanks for your presentation. Yeah. If there's Wait, let me see. Uh, no, it's another thing. If there's no other question, then I think we'll have to close it here since it's already five o'clock. Okay. So thanks a lot to everyone who participated in the webinar and special thanks to Patrick, of course, who hosted it. Um, in the upcoming days, we will send the follow-up email with a survey and we will upload the recording and the materials of this webinar. Everything will be available as well on the Scientix website. And for the Next webinars, um, please follow us on the Scientix website, and that's all for today. So thanks, everyone, again, and see you next time.